My name is Dustin Betts. I am a community manager at the Founder Institute. And today I'm going to be speaking with a founder at the forefront of digitizing human senses of taste and smell for the food industry. Uh, if you're a food or ag tech pre seed stage entrepreneur and listening, you can actually apply right now to join the upcoming uh, FI Global Food and Ag Tech Accelerator at fi.co slash food dash ecosystems. Uh, but without further ado, I'm joined here today by Francois Weinberg. He's the founder and CEO of Agena Metrics. Uh, based in Belgium, this is an FI Berlin portfolio company, simplifying life for food scientists through uh, sensory intelligence software. Uh, Francois, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi. Um, well, I, I'm, uh, like you say, the founder and uh, CEO of Agena Metrics, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today to uh, talk about uh, our project. Perfect. So before we dive into Agena Metrics, please tell us a little bit first about yourself or your own startup story. You know, what were the experiences of yours, professional or personal, that led you to founding this company, basically at, at the nexus of food science and, and artificial intelligence? Well, uh, originally, um, <clears throat> I'm an economist from the University of Brussels, and uh, I became also in the progress and uh, the process an industrial collaborator at the AI lab uh, at the Polytechnics Institute there at my university. But uh, um, after a, a very amazing project that we've been into uh, the cyber theater, we had a twice uh, a prize from UNESCO um, uh, getting uh, the best of the web award. Um, mm -hmm. I moved on to a very unexpectedly, I was conducted by a Japanese trading company uh, I was uh, then unemployed because the, the preceding uh, project was uh, a victim of, uh, you know, the bubble. So mm -hmm. that was quite some time ago. And uh, I was contacted by this really amazing company uh, dating back from 1620 uh, AD. So uh, an earlier company than the East India uh, Trading Company. And there I was a European food manager and uh, I had to face an extremely stringent and organized approach to food quality for uh, export in Japan from Europe. And uh, in large part, uh, I had to educate the suppliers in Europe to, uh, for them to be able to export their produce in, uh, in Japan, to Japan. So um, I've actually, it was so, so much so uh, uh, that uh, it later allowed me to uh, even collaborate with uh, NASA uh, through what I'd, I had learned at that company. So uh, my motivations, uh, you were speaking about them. When, when, I, when I worked at Mitsui, uh, I explored what was feasible as most advanced with one of the big fives and uh, uh, we made up a plan uh, to digitize the senses of taste and smell for the food industry. And uh, I have to say, this really kept me uh, going on for a very long time and got me thinking uh, because of two things. First of all, uh, I got started uh, while working over there uh, to uh, boot up the project with a former Microsoft speak recognition uh, company from Belgium, also uh, LNH, you know, Leonard and Hospi. And uh, they had an incubator, the Flanders Language Valley. And uh, I, we, we started working there. And uh, I met uh, some, someone who really changed my life, uh, Joel Balenson, who just had made the cover of a Wired magazine at the time uh, as the inventor of uh, the smell printer. Uh, and that was in London, uh, and uh, we discussed um, his invention and uh, the involvement of what we would like to do. And uh, well, unfortunately, him as well had problems with the bubble. So I continued uh, his uh, research for uh, uh, quite some time uh, over to uh, Switzerland, uh, then uh, to Israel, uh, then to Berlin, and, and finally came back to, to Belgium. So what's really nice in this story is that uh, he's like my dad in research, and I'm his son because I continued, uh, you know, everything uh, up to now, and we met uh, quite a, a long time afterwards, and he said, what? You did all this? And we decided to, uh, to found the company, and uh, he's a founder with me now. 
Cool. That, yeah, that's such an interesting story. Like, you, yeah, so you've been all over kind of Europe and, and doing different things with uh, yeah, data as well as with the food sciences industry. So kind of a long road traveled to find yourself here to, uh, to founding this company ultimately, yeah, with your like uh, the predecessor of the research uh, that you picked up this thread. So uh, yeah, super, super interesting. Um, now I know because I'm somewhat familiar with it uh, that, you know, uh, Agenometrics is providing so easy to interpret sensory data so that uh, food science decision making can be more accurate. Um, but sort of give us your your short pitch version uh, for those totally unfamiliar coming to this uh, blank. You know, what is a genometrics? So uh, a genometrics uh, digitizes the the measurements of uh, the sense of taste and smell for the food industry uh, through an AI B two B open source app, uh, allowing a food company of any size to implement AI and sensory digitization sorry, within their facilities and either for QC or product development. So it solves uh, the problem that nowadays, even in the 21st century, uh, digitization of the sense of smell and taste is a very, uh, it's craftsmanship, it's very artisanal. Uh, as a process and even in, in medium to large companies and even in majors, the digitization level of facilities is uh, not complete or, or uh, not even generalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to kind of dive into those industry problems and solutions a lot more here. So like for those who are, you know, removed from the food sciences industry, they, a lot of them are probably, you know, totally unaware of the level of like precision testing and data analysis that happens, uh, like in test kitchens and, and lab benches, all the things that go into uh, what food industry players, you know, you know have to, to decision making around their products before they go to the supermarket shelves. People have probably heard of like taste testers. It's like one of those jobs that, uh, you know, I, I don't know anybody who really has it, but like people who uh, imagine like one of the best jobs in the world is like being a taste tester. So maybe people have like a little bit of inkling, but um, I get the sense that this is a pretty like impenetrable industry space for most average food consumers. So can you kind of explain a little bit more about, yeah, that full scope of food science complexity here uh, in, in the, the, like the sort of problems um, that, that you're solving for? Yes, of course. Uh, it, it's funny how you put it, because uh, a few days ago I had uh, uh, an inv a potential investor from uh, from Poland, and uh, he talked to me about uh, working in a chocolate factory. And actually, he said it's it's not like such a dream job because in the end, he didn't like the product so much because he had to taste it on the line all the time to say uh -huh. whether it was uh, it, it was go or no go. But uh, yeah, how, how to uh, explain the, the the players in industry uh, have uh, to make decisions on how to organize the tests in order to measure the taste uh, and aroma. And uh, they can do it either internally or delegate it to uh, an external lab. Uh, obviously, inviting competent tasters as mouth and noses is uh, not only very troublesome during, uh, uh, for instance, the COVID pandemic uh, like we are into now, but it's also, uh, it's already so normally, it's very difficult, it's costly, it's not easy to organize and it takes considerable amounts of time. So how does it work? Um, people as tasters, they, they give notes, uh, they are judges. It's like uh, ice skating performance on the scale from one to 10, for instance, and the uh, results are being encoded. And this, uh, in addition to some lab equipment uh, and maybe a few sensors, uh, it's about how the data is currently being recorded. So uh, it's uh, still a not very elaborated process. Uh, or ID on that, it's more like making a sequential uh, file like an MP3 that is able to, uh, you know, sequentially uh, represent the uh, experience of tasting because it's like a symphony. It's really like music. You taste a mm -hmm. piece of chocolate and uh, it starts to boom with uh, the sugar and the taste of chocolate. Then you have the body of the taste and then, uh, you know, it, it fades away. And then you take another one and it starts again. So um, how uh, this is being recorded is still be, uh, happening in a very uh, old fashioned way. Uh, in such a way that the experiments are not being standardized from one to the next. And as a consequence, the results uh, are not being comparable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, there's still like some element of subjectivity, I guess, in that the, the only like, I guess, this is a very small subsection of the of, of this industry, but people, people are probably most familiar with like sommeliers and wine tasting, where it is this kind of thing where, as you described, like the, what's at the front of the palate, and then kind of like at the end. Um, and that's what happens in the food sciences industry, right? There's like professional tasters, and they, they try to make it quantitative, but there's like an element of yeah, subjectivity as I, or at least how I described it. But so, so why a genometrics? You know, talk to us a little bit more about so the digitization of this sensory data. Why is that like a, a key solution for, I mean, addressing some of these challenges? Well, uh, as you imagine, it's, it's quite complex. Uh, I, I'll try to be short uh, in order not uh, for, for people to fall asleep. Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, because uh, the organization of these tests, uh, how they are being recorded, um, there is no modern data analysis possible on the results uh, of these tests and uh, the player, the players in the industry, um, um, they have their hands at a, a large set uh, of data, but that data is just dark data. So what mm -hmm. Genometrics does is to bring uh, in an e easy framework in order to have this data standardized uh, so that, you know, across experiments, because it's really, if I can take the, the simplest example, it's like Dory in, uh, you know, the Walt Disney uh, fish story, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the clown fish. Uh, well, in uh, the world of Nemo, uh, the, 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 the experiments from one to another, they are being uh, simply uh, forgotten. Uh, and uh, this amnesia is, is just terrible. So uh, we standardize the, the, those data and uh, we, we help implement data mining and AI in order to make sense of the accumulated data. Uh, because there is so much in there, we can uh, spare batches that will be normally thrown away or save time in product development uh, in, in order not only to interpret it in a classical data mining way, but uh, to overcome the limitations of uh, the, the classical sensory science. You know, it's non-linear. It's uh, in terms of the how we interpret the data. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it's definitely com complex as you're describing it, but definitely that digitization. I like how you describe like between the different tests that co concept of amnesia, like there's just without the standardization, it's sort of just lost like between. And so, yeah, you're able to provide some more continuity through um, through that standardization. So uh, yeah, cool. I wanna talk a little bit more I guess, about the, the features. I mean, I understand like, your software can already interface with some of these like emerging uh, e noses and emails. I've only heard like a little bit about that new kind of um, sensory technology, but it sounds very interesting and really promisingly aligned with like your own technologies. So, I mean, are there, I mean, other key features of the genometrics that we haven't talked about or that you want to highlight here or in context with any of those like emerging, uh, you know, e sensors? Um, I I, I maybe I'll surprise you because uh, I'll take a, 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 an angle of approach that is a, a, a little uh, particular because it's a in fact it's a delicate matter, uh, it's a delicate issue because uh, we have for instance uh, a, a giant in the flavor and fragrance coming to us asking openly uh, how we can uh, uh, use uh, our technology to help them basically get uh, rid of all of these panels with the uh, professional testers. Uh, their idea would be uh, simply to uh, start uh, working without those. So uh, I would say we develop the tools uh, uh, and we offer them to our clients. Um, when it comes to inter interfacing the sensors uh, also uh, we are not quite uh, there yet uh, in the industry in general. It's projected in phase two uh, for the de deployment and development, but uh, it's not really what we are focusing on uh, right now because uh, the reality in the industry is that these technologies are in their birth phases uh, for industrial applications and uh, they don't really replace the human senses uh, just yet. We're, we're getting there, but uh, so there, there's indeed uh, an alignment uh, and a promise, but uh, we will still move on to uh, these types of proposals when there is a set of agreements that we will conclude with, for instance, sensor makers in order to implement interfacing. 
uh, as uh, at the moment uh, we are dependent on data exports uh, for software to include them um, well, this said, we are in discussion for a large joint venture with a, a output uh, device uh, uh, for uh, smell, which is something uh, our team has uh, had previous experience with, uh, namely with uh, with Joel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely at the very, very beginning of some, some of this sensor data, because I, I, my understanding is like the, there's people talk about the different senses that you can taste, right? Sweet, salty, mm -hmm. umami, and stuff like that. And it seems like even with that, like within the last decade or so, there's some interpretation around, well, do we know exactly all of these different parts of the tongue or do we have all the senses even, like do we even know what they are? So yeah, early days for that uh, connecting to the, the e, e mouth and, and e nose. Um, yeah. Absolutely. If, yeah. if I can add something, uh, it's that we, we are integrating uh, the, the, sense, the senses. Uh, so we, we do uh, the, the complete uh, phasing of uh, smelling smelling in the nose space in the mouth and of course uh, tasting and the tasting experience is uh, 70 to 18 percent uh, smelling so we, we we do all of it and uh, it's clear also that in the future and uh, this is uh, repeatedly asked uh, to us uh, to integrate elements like texture and uh, also um, it, it can go pretty far uh, because we, we can imagine uh, in, to integrate vision because it matters. Um, of course, texture, because if you eat a chips, uh, if it's not cracking, you, you won't eat the second one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because uh, there are also e e uh, experiments going on with uh, the, uh, the judges uh, that is pretty uh, interesting because uh, when you see their reactions, for instance, that can be measured also. The emotional uh, component uh, is very important, and we, we can integrate that because what we do is to uh, make a data repository to uh, characterize uh, food items. Uh, so that is uh, something we, we can look into, of course. Yeah, that's really interesting because I knew that like uh, how connected your sense of smell and taste are, but yeah, I hadn't even thought about texture. Obviously, that's a huge deal. And yeah, like the, the other data, you could get like the emotional reaction to build like that comprehensive um, picture. That's a, yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, so if I'm a food scientist here in this right now for the first time, um, uh, how, how can I get started uh, using uh, Genometrics? Um, it, it is launched and, and out there in the world, right? Yeah. I would say uh, if you if you are a food scientist uh, hearing this uh, and uh, are uh, interested, we are actively looking for use cases, uh, including uh, involving sensors. So I really invite you uh, to contact us through our website. Uh, we have a calendar in place. Uh, you can uh, or directly uh, uh, book a demo, which uh, uh, I will probably hold and uh, uh, we will showcase the, the, the technology. So that's the, the, the best channel we, ha we have in place uh, for, for the moment. And uh, about uh, implementing a genometrics uh, in, uh, in your company, uh, that is, uh, it's quite straightforward. Uh, we uh, are making a data audit and uh, we work on data lakes and data warehousing in order you know, to realize couples of data between production data, PCM, you know, physical, chemical, and uh, we uh, bind that with uh, uh, the sensory data. So we, we have an integrated approach to quality uh, control um, because, you know, quality uh, is determined in T plus one and uh, quality uh, is determined by production, which is taken in T. So there is a desynchronization that we are, uh, um, getting through with AI and uh, then we are getting expected behaviors instead of having to wait for the experiments to take place. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting. So please, uh, please come. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so that's you and your listening. Yeah, go over. Uh, we'll have the websites linked here everywhere that we're sharing this conversation. And yeah, you can book a demo and um, yeah, see if you jump, jump on board. Uh, this is my next question is uh, the one where I ask uh, you, my guest, uh, to make a prediction, which is basically, uh, you know, be a future prognosticator here. Uh, how do you think these data technologies are ultimately going to change food science uh, over the next, say, decade, like 10 years from now? Uh, so 
I, I will take uh, again uh, a relatively classic take on, on this, but uh, we are clearly at the start of a revolution of how data is being integrated into food production. This can be, uh, I insist, a very positive change because there is a real promise of how customization and even transparency, uh, which is taboo in the food industry, and uh, a booming of, of the different niches that we can see uh, appear of products being offered to uh, the world populations with as many diets and dietary customs that there are as group of people, people suffering from food related diseases, uh, people with special diets, uh, different religious habits, all uh, are sources of so many different niches uh, the food producers have to learn to address. So just, uh, I will take a, an example, a practical one, uh, as of today, uh, how Burger King, for instance, um, offers a wonderful choice of vegan placed uh, based burgers. Uh, and I was amazed to taste one of those because uh, you can feel there is uh, more engineering of how uh, it tastes um, compared to a flagship regular meat burger. Um, the taste palette in there is wonderful. It's very vegetable based and uh, the plant based burger homo homogenizes uh, in where uh, uh, with a very tasty palette. That's very interesting because there are places in the world where uh, these developments are very welcome. But um, uh, I will take, for instance, uh, LATAM, you know, so South America. Um, mm -hmm. They have a sense, for instance, of how uh, tasty the um, uh, meat has to be. And uh, in order, and it's their main criteria to choose what they will eat. So as a consequence, uh, if you want to sell a, a, a veggie burger over there, it has to perform better than uh, a regular meat burger. I think this is an excellent uh, take on uh, how it's going to deploy all of these technologies. And um, I think it's just the beginning. Uh, and we see how much more uh, of those uh, refined uh, tastes uh, are appearing. It is also clear in my experience of working with Japan and Asian taste palettes that uh, our traditional food is uh, booming with a creativity that is unmatched uh, compared to the past. So uh, to answer the question, it is clear that uh, technology is helping to reduce, uh, for instance, fat contents, sugar, and salt for a determined uh, taste envelope today will, uh, with the help of AI, uh, achieve unpredictable and uh, great developments in terms of the variety and customization of the food we eat, and uh, also uh, produce greater adaptation of the consumer and the request from the customers as uh, the choice uh, that uh, the industry offers uh, expands. So uh, this trend uh, is uh, likely to produce great changes in the future. Uh, data will serve these developments because uh, in the end, uh, it's the consumer uh, having fixed range physically of how he tastes and smells food. And uh, for that reason, the offer of new food will uh, have to be constrained by that in some way. So when there is a constraint, creativity has a space to develop and uh, uh, therefore data will be instrumental in uh, fine tuning and better satisfy uh, the customers uh, in terms of how they are served. And I think it's very exciting what's coming up. Yeah, me too. It seems like it's probably the most exciting time maybe ever for food science, really, because of yeah, all the emerging technologies that are coming out, like you were mentioned. I mean, it's interesting, too, how you tie back some of these like cultural elements of like uh, that maybe constrain our sort of preferences around taste. But it's possible like there could be totally new flavor profiles that are sort of like, you know, where it's like impossible or beyond burgers are obviously meant to like stimulate, you know, uh, the, the more normal, I guess, like meat products. But yeah, just the food science technologies of the future that might unleash just totally different flavors or things that we've, you know, not experienced before. Um, it seems like a really exciting time 
for the industry. Uh, yeah, I love the predictions there uh, in depth. Um, what advice would you offer to kind of pivot hard back to entrepreneurship here uh, for a very early stage or maybe even just an aspiring entrepreneur who's just getting started? Uh, any knowledge that you've accumulated since uh, working on a genometrics that you wish you kind of uh, knew at the very beginning of your founder journey? Yeah. Um being busy with uh, this project for so long, uh, it's uh, over 20 years now. Uh, first of all, uh, never ever give up on your ID once, once it gets uh, some level of validation. Of course, you have to go through that and sometimes slightly pivot, but uh, um, in general, just don't. Uh, uh, be, uh, you, secondly, you, you have, I think, to consider, uh, I, I don't want to go into ad mode, but uh, uh, I think tools like the Founder Institute uh, help you reach your goals in entrepreneurship because uh, it is such a prone environment to manage all the early challenges you are confronted with while creating your company that by the time you graduate, you basically do everything by instinct and uh, you get used to make your way uh, towards success. And uh, the third point, finally, if I, uh, I think... Uh, it gets to a very particular environment nowadays when um, it becomes more and more natural to network with people and achieve uh, most of your desires in entrepreneurship through dedication. Uh, I then encourage anyone uh, wanting to make his or her uh, ID real to consider to become an entrepreneur and to found a business in order to make it real. I think really we are in, in special times and uh, uh, let, let's hope it really stays that way. But uh, uh, I, I think uh, it's it, we are uh, living amazing times. Yeah, that, thanks for for saying that. And yeah, I like that kind of uh, element of perseverance. And yeah, like uh, entrepreneurship is kind of the way to actualize your your sort of vision out in the world. Uh, so yeah, obviously we agree with that at the Founder Institute. So uh, cool. Uh, the final question I have for you is just uh, to wrap up on you know where is the you know, metrics headed next. Uh, I understand you might, you're currently fundraising if you want to elaborate about that or any other news or final updates to share with the Founder Institute community uh, or ask for the audience who, who might be watching here today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, we are today, uh, after less than a year um, of the foundation of the, the company in Belgium, uh, we are already operating from eight different locations around the world on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, we maybe, uh, you know, we don't have sales just yet, but we are really on the verge of it. And uh, we are launching our first 2 million uh, straight away round. Uh, that's very ambitious. Uh, and it corresponds to our ambition to propose uh, things like a, a sensory file standard. Um, a, like it's like a Photoshop file of the sensory kind that uh, is digitally modifiable, but implementable as a recipe in reality. Uh, eventually, even with a cost estimate, that uh, is one of the things we are working on in, in Agile Metrics research. Uh, also, we uh, one very important thing uh, for the future is that we operate uh, in a hybrid mode between a startup and a research foundation. In OSS, you would compare that to, uh, you know, canonical with uh, Ubuntu. It's uh, something that makes us special in the way uh, we protect the consumer. Uh, at Agenometrics, we have an ethical manager in the organization and uh, uh, we are .org. Uh, We want uh, our client to visit us to achieve better results in uh, offering healthy products to uh, the customers, the consumers. Uh, and in this instance, uh, I would see, uh, I, I, I would bounce on, on what I saw uh, recently uh, about the interviews. Uh, possibly a genometrics uh, in the future could interface with apps such as bettermeal.ai uh, in order to offer sensory preference and uh, more adapted and healthy diets to the consumer. But based on the, you know, starting with uh, their sensory preferences, that would be very interesting. I think there's a, an amazing set of possibilities that are just being defined uh, now on how taste and smell digitization and uh, digitization of the experience of eating will interact with, with us uh, even up to the metaverse.
Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Once you add this element of digitization into the food sciences industry, there are ways that you could collaborate, you know, with other, uh, all kinds of other technologies to sort of the sky's kind of the limit. Yeah, we're definitely at the very uh, beginnings here. Uh, this has been really interesting for me personally. I, I find this stuff fascinating, learning about the intersection of artificial intelligence and, uh, yeah, sensory experiences here. Uh, and we're all at the Foundry Institute, definitely looking forward to keeping up with the genometrics and, and where you're headed next. But um, Francois Weinberg, thanks so much again for joining us today. Welcome. And uh, if there is uh, any uh, uh, people from the academic world, we are also uh, in research. So uh, uh, in the United States or anywhere in the world, we're open for collaborations. Yeah, so please reach out. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. Bye-bye.